as we saw from the as we saw from the the video uh, preventing harm and violence against children is possible in humanitarian settings and it's extremely important to recognize that the type of violence against children that happens in humanitarian settings transcends all settings as we saw from from the video um, the the situation humanitarian settings whether it's uh, you know refugee settings natural disasters armed conflict um, really do exacerbate what are pre-existing um, risks to children but also create some new risks and particularly risks to children related to armed conflict um, and so today's session we'll be really talking about what can we do what are the proven evidence-based um, approaches to be able to actually prevent that kind of violence in humanitarian settings. And I'm very pleased that this is a collaboration between, um, between a number of actors spanning the development and humanitarian um, areas of intervention on protecting children. I won't name all the partners um, because there's been such a huge uh, effort, collaborative effort to put this, this, this event together, but we're really pleased to, to see that we have UN actors government authorities, um, the, the various uh, uh, networks of, of actors at the global level working on these areas. So huge thanks to everyone. Um, what I'm going to do is just quickly run through the agenda. We hope that most of you are online. Um, have been able to see the agenda, but I'll just give you a bit of a taster of some of the the, the amazing panel and uh, speakers we have lined up today. Um, first of all, we'll be hearing from, from uh, Melissa Horn from USAID um, to give us some opening remarks. Afterwards, we'll, we'll be hearing from Hani Mansourian, who will be talking on, on behalf of the Alliance for Child Protection and Humanitarian Action, um, really talking about um, how can we uh, uh, prevent violence in humanitarian action. Then we'll be hearing, hearing from uh, Daniela uh, Leggero from Together From Girls talking about data and the importance of data uh, in terms of preventing violence. We'll also be hearing uh, um, from our colleagues uh, Elizabeth Dev Lowe from USAID in terms of a donor perspective. And we have the, we also have our, our honorable minister, Anya Kun um, from the, from the uh, Minister of Relief, Disaster Preparedness and Refugees from the government of Uganda joining us. We're also very pleased to have our civil society colleagues and partners represented today here with uh, Mohammed Haruni from the from the Jordan River Foundation. And then we'll be really um, having a packed session. Apologies for the noise in the background, colleagues. I'm here in the office. Um, and some Q&A, uh, an opportunity really to hear from, from many, many of the, the um, colleagues who are online. Please feel free to put uh, your, as we're going through, um, please feel free to put your comments or, or questions in the chat. We will try to have a, a good opportunity at the end to be able to come back to them. Um, I see also Sabine, thanks for the reminder. There's interpretation available in, in, in Spanish or French. So feel free to, to let us know if you would like to have access to that. Um, and with that said, I'm now going to hand over to Melissa Horn Albuja. Um, Melissa is the Acting Chief for Protection and Community uh, Capacities Division in the Bureau of Humanitarian Assistance. She's spent much of her long and uh, illustrious career um, advocating for the rights of vulnerable people and working for protection both in the field and in the government. So very pleased to have you with us, Melissa, and please, uh, please feel free to handing over to you. Thank you so much. I'm honored to be here I'm back with the child protection community, which is um, where I started um, my career. Um, um, and, and just welcome everybody. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Um, so thank you for leading this critical conversation today. I'm honored to represent the United States government, both BHA and PRM, and reaffirming our commitment to child protection and emergencies. Now more than ever, children affected by crises demand and deserve our attention. Almost 70% of the world's children are living in crisis affected countries and children also make up a majority of the at-risk population our humanitarian efforts seek to reach. We recognize that even in the best of times, child protection is unfortunately underfunded. 
However, with the COVID-19 pandemic, we're really seeing that many more children are in need and the funding and resources have yet to keep up with these ever expanding needs. COVID-19 has also significantly set back global gains for children, which will have ripple effects, we're afraid, for, for years to come. As a result of the pandemic, many more children than ever are out of school and many will not return, with girls the most impacted by this. Child labor, child marriage, violence against children, including gender-based violence are all on the rise. We've observed this issue in our Central America response to COVID-19, where school closures and lack of remote learning options have left children, particularly adolescents, even more vulnerable to gang violence and recruitment, violence and, and early pregnancy. <clears throat> it's clear that action is needed on several levels. Extending more resources is only part of the answer. We recognize that over the years, that being reactive is not enough. We must make greater efforts to prevent violence against children in the first place. The United States has been a strong advocate for the inclusion of child protection as a key and critical component to all of our global responses to humanitarian crises. And in the past few years, we, along with many of you and colleagues in the field, have sought to take stock of what is working when it comes to prevention. While we address the urgent critical needs, we have to also focus more strategically on rolling out prevention initiatives and conducting new research to fill critical gaps in the evidence base. This work also includes improving systems and empowering and investing in local stakeholders. The United States is supporting a number of international organizations and NGOs to fill the knowledge gap on prevention. Programming, we know, must be contextualized, recognize root causes, and impact behavior change. The ultimate goal of all of these efforts is that children and their caregivers are safe from harm before it occurs and receive the necessary support that they need to survive, thrive, and reach their full potential. At the systems level, the pandemic has really drawn out just how needed schools and social services are. Yet this is not a problem the humanitarian community can tackle alone. We must work in partnership with our development counterparts to support the continuation of programming before and long after the acute phase of crisis has ended, all in the effort to prevent further harm. On behalf of the United States government, Thank you for convening this important event to raise the awareness about the dire situation of children today. It's an opportunity to learn from your experiences and identify how we can carry forward this important mission to prevent harm to children. Thank you. Thank you so much, Melissa. And I think your message about really, you know, us uh, investing in prevention um, and trying to get out of this constant uh, cycle of response is really crucial. So thank you very much for that. And we look forward to hearing from our other colleagues about, about some details on how that, that can be put in place. Now going to hand over to Hani Mansourian. Um, Hani is, is well known to many of us on, on, on the call. Um, and uh, I personally met Hani in one of the first emergencies where we both worked in, in BAM um, in the earthquake. So Hani, as, as you know, is the uh, uh, director of uh, the coordinator, sorry, of the Alliance for Humanitarian Action um, and has worked for many, many years on uh, refugee issues as well as child protection, working with local NGOs as well as international NGOs um, and UN agencies and um, in many settings. So we're really pleased to introduce Hani. Um, over to you, Hani. Thank you very much, um, Amanda, and, and thanks, Melissa, for um, setting setting the the scene for us, um, mentioning some of the issues and and how um, your government sees the the solution on on prevention. And we are very we very welcome this this um, kind of focus on on prevention. So the alliance has been um, working um, on actively promoting a more preventative approach for about three years now. Um, this week, as we speak, um, our annual meeting is is ongoing, and the theme of this annual meeting has been prevention. So a lot of our work has culminated in, in, in what is happening during our annual meetings um, as, as we speak. We have been having some incredible series of discussions with child protection community on how prevention can work in humanitarian settings. We have been dispelling the myth that prevention can only be done in development context, 
and discussing simple and practical techniques that can help us prevent harm before it occurs in humanitarian settings. We have heard over 45 examples by practitioners and, and academics on best practices and lessons learned on preventive approaches um, and, and how they're being implemented uh, at the field level uh, at the moment. Uh, today, as part of the Solution Summit series, we are trying to draw the attention of, of donors, governments, and others to a few key elements that I would like to, to highlight. Number one um, is, uh, is the fact that the child protection sector still remains disproportionately underfunded in the humanitarian sphere. Uh, in 2020 and 2021, um, we, together with some of our partners, Save the Children, UNHCR, UNICEF, and uh, Child Protection Area of Responsibility, analyzed that, uh, the funding situation of the child protection in humanitarian action sector. We produced two reports uh, in 2020. It was called Unprotected. In 2021, it was called Still Unprotected. And in both instances, the report found chronic gaps um, in funding for child protection. It identified issues of un unpredictability in funding and disparities across responses. Just a reality check. Um, in 2019, $252 million uh, was spent on child protection and humanitarian action. The same year, $62 billion was spent on the race to space, discovering other planets and other, other elements that come with it. Um, 72.9 billion US dollars in the same year was spent um, on maintenance and, and development of nuclear weapons. That's 290 times what was spent on child protection. I mentioned that not because any of us are making those decisions, but just to say what a long way we have to go in advocating uh, for children and for the rights of children and for getting our priorities right. The second issue I want to, to mention is Prevention and specifically primary prevention is feasible and achievable as colleagues mentioned in humanitarian settings. We can effectively identify and address risk factors to harm while also strengthening protective factors amidst humanitarian crisis before, during and after them. It is not, it is not only a more dignifying approach to humanitarian action, but it is also cost effective. And also um, we also have an ethical imperative to prevent harm when it is possible to do so. Practical ways to, to prevent harm have been documented in the minimum standards for child protection and humanitarian action, as well as the INSPIRE package. While prevention should not take away any investment from critical remedial actions that we currently do, every dollar that we invest in prevention will reduce the need for, for responsive action, hence saving us money in the long run. The third point uh, is uh, the multi-sectoral nature of prevention and the fact that it gives us the opportunity to capitalize on the resources available across the humanitarian field outside of the, of the child protection sector. Through the prevention lens, the complementarity nature of different sectoral in interventions become abundantly clear. The prevention approach will help us more clearly see how joint and integrated programming can optimize resources by contributing to and reinforcing several sectoral outcomes. For example, a livelihood or nutritional program can in fact prevent child labor or recruitment, while child protection programs can enhance nutritional or educational outcomes. So we're gaining two or three things uh, with one investment. In essence, the prevention has helped help us see the child more holistically. The Alliance currently works very actively on cross-sectoral co collaboration for the same reasons that I mentioned. Um, it's also part of our new strategy that was actually released yesterday. My colleague will, um, will paste the, the link in the chat for all of you to see it. We also work on cross-sectoral collaboration very actively under the pillar four of our minimum standards um, in collaboration with a lot of the uh, actors that are in, on this call. And the last point, is that we would like to urge donors and governments present on this call and beyond to become advocates of prevention lens for child protection in, uh, programming in their areas of influence. Part of this is linked to increasing funding cycles from six to 12 months, which is very typical in humanitarian settings, to multi-year funding. With the average age of a humanitarian crisis being at nine years at the moment, we can't really justify six to 12 month cycles anymore. This will enable longer term thinking and planning, including systemic inclusion of, um, of prevention aspects in child protection and human interaction programming. 
we would like to continue this dialogue with, with donors, partners, governments, and understanding how we can, we can work together to promote this preventative lens and overcome the hurdles that may exist. Thank you very much. Back to you, Amanda. Thank you, Hani. And as usual, you really eloquently summed up some of the key points. Um, particularly want to draw attention to one of the points that you mentioned, which is the importance of having an integrated approach, not only having child protection, but also really leveraging the, the, the possibility of all the other interventions we make in humanitarian settings to contribute to and better protect children and, and the synergies and, and cost efficiencies that can be gained um, from this type of approach. So um, very, very um, insightful from your side. I'm going to now hand over to um, Daniela. Uh, Daniela Ligero is the Executive Director and, and Chief Executive Officer, Officer of, of Together for Girls. Um, and um, has been working tirelessly for many years to end violence against children, particularly the, the, the issue of sexual violence. And I know Daniela is a passionate advocate for many, many years of, of this and, and an eloquent um, speaker and, and, and advocate around the issues of gender equality, as well as um, ending violence against children, particularly violence against girls. Um, herself being a survivor and having spoken uh, uh, publicly and passionately about the need to ensure that not one more child has to suffer these kind of um, violence. So over to you, Daniela. Um, thanks for joining us. Thank you so much, Amanda. It's such a, a privilege to be here with all of you. And I really appreciate um, my colleagues who spoke earlier, uh, Melissa and Hani, excellent points you made. Yeah, so I have a few slides just to give a little bit of context. So I'm going to try this out. Let's see. Yes. Okay. So yeah, as Amanda said, um, I work for Together for Girls. We are a public-private partnership that is focused on ending violence against children, and we pay special attention to sexual violence and to the gender dimensions of that violence against children and adolescents. And as you can see here, several of the um, representatives on this call today are part of our partnership. But most importantly, we also have over 20 national governments that are part of this partnership. Um, and I wanna um, honor the minister. Thank you for your leadership um, in Uganda. There has been so much work that's happened there on this issue. Um, we work with a pretty straightforward model. And I will say we are primarily working in, you know, in development settings. Um, and our model has been in place for over a decade now. It's pretty straightforward data and advocacy to drive action. And really what this means is we start with really understanding the size and the magnitude of the problem of violence against children and adolescents. Uh, this particular piece of work is led by the U.S. Centers for Disease Control with national governments, UNICEF, and other partners to really understand a lot of granularity around violence for those under the age of 24. So children, adolescents, and youth, boys and girls. And you get a flavor of everything from times of day, locations, perpetrators, types of violence to really offer insight into understanding the problem, because we believe it's really hard to do programming and especially prevention, which you were mentioning, honey, is so important, if you don't fully understand the magnitude of the problem. Um, and then those data along with targeted advocacy lead to nationally led, evidence-based, multi-sectoral responses to create results at scale. Um, we are delighted to say that at this point, we have been active in over 23 countries from around the world with um, data now for over 11% of the world's population under 24, really making it the single largest repository of violence against children, adolescents, and youth globally. And there's a lot of information that is then led to actually programming policies, responses that have been effective. And I wanted to show you Kenya for a second because some of my colleagues have mentioned 
you know, this idea that oftentimes we believe prevention is not possible and that violence against children is intractable. That is not true. And now we have evidence at a population level to show that. So I wanna show you the, the VAX, um, the survey, the Violence Against Children and Youth surveys that were done in 2010 and then in 2019 and over a period of nine years at a population level. Again, this is you know, data that represents the entire nation. We saw significant decreases in all forms of violence um, against boys and girls we also found, and this is interesting, there were a couple of places where we actually saw a little bit of an increase. And so that granularity helps you understand, okay, here are the places where our programs, you know, programs and policies that the government of Kenya and others put into place made a difference. And here are places where, where that didn't happen. But it is possible to reduce violence against children, adolescents, and youth at a population level. And we're beginning, this is all very new still, but we're beginning to be able to show that. And since we are talking about humanitarian settings, um, I just wanna say that we are really excited that over the last year, we have worked closely with CDC, the government of Canada, as well as the IRC and many other partners, um, many of whom are here to adapt the survey, the methodology, the questions that we've developed via the VAX for use in humanitarian settings. We understand that, you know, as part of doing effective prevention, it is important to better understand the details around the issues of violence against children, adolescents, and youth. We don't have good data for these settings. And as many have mentioned already, you know, anywhere from nine to 20 years is the amount of time that these kids are spending in these settings. So it really is their lifetime oftentimes. And so we can no longer justify these short-term kind of cycles um, of intervention, and we believe there, there could be value in really ascertaining within a particular setting a better understanding of what's happening in order to be able to respond uh, more effectively. And, you know, I, I do want to just say I'm excited about the opportunity of the connection between the kind of development and humanitarian space and the connectivity and the learning that we can do from each other. So this is a new area of work for us, and we're excited to get started on it. Um, and with that, um, I promise to be brief because I'm going to hand it over to Dr. Chichundi, um, who is from the Population Council and is actually going to be piloting um, a survey on violence against children, building off of some of the work we've done with some technical assistance uh, from CDC. And so great to hear from you, Chichi, around kind of the piloting that you'll be doing moving forward. Thanks so much. Thank you very much, Daniela, um, for setting that up so nicely. Um, I believe I'm supposed to share my screen. So let me see if I can do that. Uh, and hello to everybody. I have to apologize that um, my bandwidth issues just will not permit me to um, put on my camera, but hopefully you can see my screen. Um, and I'd like to pick up from uh, where Daniela left off. Um, to just talk about uh, how delighted we are to have the opportunity to, to put that uh, humanitarian VAX implementation guide to use uh, within a few countries, uh, starting with Uganda, under a, an FCDO funded research program consortium that we refer to as Baobab. Um, and the whole goal of this uh, research program consortium is to fill gaps in evidence, the very gaps that Daniela was um, referring to um, in sexual and reproductive health and rights uh, within refugee settings in the East and Horn of Africa. And as Daniela um, so rightly put it, we now have um, populations that have spent decades, generations of populations within um, refugee settings. And so we can no longer make the excuse that um, we, can't, we can't do certain surveys. And what Baobab aims to do is to start to bring some of these really well-regarded, robust surveys that have been used elsewhere um, into refugee settings for the first time. Um, and uh, we draw on the former DFID's uh, comment about wanting to have a bigger, better, and faster humanitarian response capability. And we believe that you know, introducing some of these surveys that we've been able to take for granted outside refugee settings would be extremely helpful. So we'll be doing a number of surveys under this program. 
Um, but I'm focusing today just for a few minutes on the Violence Against Children survey in particular. Uh, this research program consortium, I should stay, say, um, it spans a five and a half year period. It began just in January this year. And um, it's a partnership uh, between the Population Council, the African Population and Health Research Center, Wellmade Strategy, and of course, FCDL. Um, and I just want to really focus on the importance of partnerships uh, within this work as we begin our preparation. So we've basically been preparing um, for a number of months now, and uh, we expect to begin data collection before the year ends. So the last quarter of uh, the year, which we're in right now. On this slide, I've just, I deliberately wanted to give, show the array of partners that it's taking and that it will take um, to make sure that uh, this survey is implemented properly. And you'll notice at the center, we have persons of concern to UNHCR. We're focusing specifically uh, on refugees, um, but a range of government partners, UNHCR of course has been our strategic partner for a while, both at the regional level um, and uh, at the country level. Um, the GBV area of responsibility, local advisory boards and so on and so forth. So it's really going to take a village um, to get this work off the ground um, and to sustain it. And I should say that over the course of this year, we have um, established partnerships with at least half of the um, institutions you see are displayed up here. And we'll continue to uh, ensure that we are forging these partnerships to ensure that uh, this work uh, gets off the ground properly um, and is used in the end um, to make a difference in the lives of uh, refugees. And in terms of preparation, it's also about, in addition to forging the right partnerships, nurturing and sustaining them, it's also about uh, tailoring um, this VAX to specific humanitarian contexts. I mean, Daniela's slide, I deliberately borrowed this picture on the left from Daniela's slide. And the picture on the right is a picture uh, of a refugee settlement um, in Uganda. Um, just to show sort of the stark contrast that there can be between different kinds of refugee settings. Um, and therefore, uh, the need to really draw on local knowledge, the knowledge of refugees themselves, the knowledge of those who work with them um, to ensure that we are carrying out this survey as appropriately and ethically uh, as possible. So these are the things that uh, we are doing um, heading up to the actual implementation uh, of this particular survey. And ultimately our goals really are um, to use these data that we end up collecting and leverage the partnerships that we are forging and sustaining to prioritize and inform prevention efforts. Uh, similar to the VAX, which I know that uh, Daniela didn't have enough time to really talk about, but you know, what happens after the VAX? After the VAX, there's uh, typically a national, a refugee, a national response plan, apologies, uh, that happens um, in the development sector that brings together government and non-governmental organizations um, provides technical assistance um, to get them to look through the data and use that data to map out what makes sense for their context in terms of you know, programs, prevention and response programs that need to be implemented. We plan to use the same model and do this for refugees specifically. And so to have, call it a national refugee response plan based on what we learned from the first ever VAX in uh, humanitarian settings in Uganda. And ultimately uh, through that process, we hope that um, the country will begin to implement effective prevention and response actions, which will lead to the end of violence against children. I only had a few minutes, so I'm going to end there and uh, thank you all for your attention. Thank you very much, Daniela and Chichi. I mean, I think it's so fascinating the work that you, you've been able to do and also really this the power of, of data to inform more effective um, prevention work is, is so, well illustrated by the work you're, you're doing. And also I think it's it's fantastic to show that it is possible to do these kind of um, uh, in-depth nuanced studies on the nature and causes of, of violence in humanitarian settings, including in refugee settings. It was particularly um, 
you know, struck by, by the importance of partnership and how indeed it takes a village to do this. And particularly in terms of your, your message, Chichi, about the importance of partnership with refugees and communities who often actually are the experts on the nature of violence um, and their experiences of it in a day-to-day -day level and, and can provide some, you know, really important insights in how to, to prevent it. So thank you so much for that. I was also very impressed by... I was also very impressed by the statistic from Daniela of 11%, having been able to get 11% of, of, of the world's population of children and, and young people covered by the surveys. It's an incredible job. So thank you so much for the work you're, you're both doing. I'm now going to hand over to um, Elizabeth uh, Deb, Deblo who is a humanitarian protection advisor um, and acting team lead uh, with the protection team at uh, USAID's uh, Bureau for Humanitarian Assistance. And her role is to support the agency and the partners on technical components of protection programming. Apologies, as you can see, I am reading some of the bios because my memory is not good to be able to um, memorize all of the exceptional uh, speakers uh, backgrounds here on, on that we have on the panel. So over to you, um, Elizabeth. Thank you, Amanda. And thank you so much to all. It's such an honor to be here with um, professionals with such expertise and passion for a cause that is so critical, um, especially as we consider that children make the majority of populations humanitarian settings. Um, so today we're here to talk about prevention and I've gotten to be a part of the Alliance uh, meetings this week and it's just been fantastically inspiring to listen to what we know works when it comes to prevention. I'd like to speak from the donor perspective. What does BHA um, fund in terms of prevention and where do we stand with it all? Um, first of all, we're taking an increased focus on prevention, recognizing that prevention is just the smart way of doing business. Um, when we think about the fact that it is not only more economical to prevent rather than to treat, but also prevention where done correctly is much more effective in saving lives than coming in after the fact to respond. In terms of prevention, we've spoken about it um, prior um, in terms of how prevention is noted in child protection minimum standards. We've spoken about it in the INSPIRE strategies. And as we do move forward in terms of supporting evidence-based approaches, I just wanted to mention a few of the these approaches that BHA supports and remind ourselves and what do we know works? What do we know is working in terms of prevention? Um, first of all, and we've been speaking about this a lot at the Alliance meetings, it's the community-driven responses, the community-based protection mechanism. We firmly believe that it takes buy-in from local communities for any program to work and that we must lean on community-driven approaches in order to change norms and values in support of mitigating violence, protecting children. Um, we have to this end supported the community engagement and case management project with PLAN and the Alliance to really enhance how we work with local volunteers to provide essential protection services to children. Second, we also really um, firmly support system strengthening. We really believe that it will take a sustained effort um, to maintain this prevention of violence, this mitigation of violence, and the sustained effort means ensuring that systems are set up and functioning and doing what they need to do in order to uh, keep families well. And this is an activity that falls very well within the nexus. We recognize that we must collaborate with our development colleagues. We must share knowledge. Um, and case in point, going back to where we started the INSPIRE strategies, which were developed on the development side. Um, also, if we've learned anything out of COVID, it's that we cannot trust that borders will remain open for the so-called experts to come and go and support service provision. And as such, we must rely on the actual experts on the ground, those who are locally available. Um, and so not only do we want to support systems, but we want to in in the supportive system, support localization of our efforts. 
Um, on that point, what I'll mention is that we supported this online platform with the Alliance, also with PLAN to disseminate adaptations for programming in COVID times. Um, and while we recognize that that is and has been useful, um, we recognize in the system strengthening and localization effort, we cannot only rely on webinars, um, but we must look at other ways um, that aren't reliant on internet provision and that don't play only to say one learning style. Um, and so we're very excited that the Alliance has continued to prioritize localization um, as a priority in their strategy going forward and how do we better support localization and all the creative ways that we hope that happen in the future. Third, we also really believe that parents are the first line of defense to preventing violence against their children. And we very strongly support parenting, skills development, um, efforts that support the whole family holistically. Um, we're currently funding with the IRC, a parenting program specifically aimed at reducing recruitment of children into armed groups and supporting reintegration of those who are coming out. And as we talk about CAFAG, um, the fourth thing that we look at is the recognition that we must specialize our programming for children. We believe that children and young people have the, necessi have the agency to tell us what they need, um, that they can learn skills to keep themselves safe, um, and that they're not a homogenous group, that childhood is not a single experience, but that there are a variety of developmental stages that occur through childhood and that we must tailor our programming to these individual stages and needs, gender and other related. And so we really focus in on these specialized programming. Um, as we speak to specialized programming, a priority that DHA is really looking at currently, um, and this is with the Thrive Act that came into being in the US recently, is we're looking at early childhood development. Again, a place where we really are seeing primary prevention at its best when we work with children in the zero to five range and protect them from ever experiencing violence so that their development is uh, honed to the best of its uh, capacity and they're given the most opportunity to thrive going forward. Uh, two more points on this. Um, during COVID, we also saw that psychosocial support and mental health, I think the world over saw how it is so core to well-being um, and how we must protect our mental health as well as our physical health. And while BHA supported, along with the global community, MHPSS to be a core component of COVID response, we continue to see that this is a core component to prevention programming. And where we support families uh, to remain well, we will support their children to be well. Um, then we also look at multi-sectoral programming. And this is a focus that BHA is taking um, with greater emphasis, we recognize that we cannot stay, and we've, we've said this for a long time, but I think we're shouting it from the mountaintops now, we cannot stay in the silos that we are in. Um, we, will, we will make much better use of resources by integrating alongside other sectors, and we will reach more children. Not every child shows up to a child-friendly space. They may be standing in line for food, or they may be with their mothers at the nutrition clinic, or they may be selling water in the informal sector. We must reach out to the other sectors and integrate protection programming alongside if we're really truly going to reach children, children in need and reach children before they have the worst experiences of violence. Lastly, we must continue to ensure across all sectors of programming that our programs are safe, that we're preventing sexual exploitation and abuse been conducted by those who are providing services, <clears throat> that we are inclusive in our programs. Excuse me, I have a <laughs> little cat trying to interrupt me here. Um, I'm going to uh, step on to one last piece of this, which is how does DHA identify our priorities and what challenges do we face in terms of funding? 
So absolutely in terms of how we develop our priorities, we look to those on the ground. We look to those who are providing the services presently in the context. Um, we look at the assessments that have been done with the communities and what communities are declaring are their needs. And all of those often will feed into the HNOs and HRPs, which is where we look um, when we prioritize. We also fund what we know is having an impact. So the evidence-based and best practice approaches. In terms of what are the challenges, other than being constrained by our own budget uh, caps at various times, we're also constrained by the demand that is coming or not coming. The lack of demonstrated need um, where uh, potentially partners aren't um, uh, pushing for programming or where there is no capacity to roll out programming. Um, in terms of demonstrated need, here is where data absolutely comes into play. Um, and we continue to support uh, and emphasize that we must standardize the way that we collect data and we must simplify it so that it can be done on a regular routine basis throughout all programming. If we don't, if we're not measuring what we're doing, are we truly do we truly know that what we're doing is having the impact we intended? And so with the IRC and the protection cluster, we are funding the protection analytical framework to really standardize quality data collection across the protection space. And as we look at that trickle down into the child protection space. Um, I'll close up here by saying um, that we within BHA are going to continue to prioritize protection across all of our response efforts. And we are specifically looking at present, noting the impact COVID has had on children to really strengthen our institutional engagement on child protection. We're working closely with PRM to identify better ways of working across the US government to strengthen our support to child protection. We've engaged in consultations with various Protect, child protection partners to look at better ways of working. Um, and we will continue as we go forward to really emphasize child protection um, and prevention within child protection to ensure that children's futures are kept safe. Um, now is the time for action. We've seen too much impact from COVID and uh, today our children need our support. So thank you again for having us. Thank you so much, Elizabeth. I mean, uh, such a compelling uh, call to action for all of us that we simply cannot wait anymore. Um, and that there is evidence-based programs out there and it is possible to prevent through engagement with communities, working with children and parents as partners, um, as well as you know, looking at how we can take um, approaches from the development uh, work, evidence-based and adapt and, and, and scale them up in humanitarian settings. And so, you know, really appreciate your, your call to action um, here and also your commitment uh, to really funding these kind of prevention programs. Thank you. So now we're going to turn to uh, the Honourable Minister uh, Ayakun from uh, Uganda. Um, the Honourable Minister has, uh, uh, I'm, I'm going to struggle to remember all of her diplomas and um, educational uh, experiences. I did try to note them all down, but apologies if I missed some. Um, uh, diplomas in social work and social administration, health administration, procurement and logistics, um, and has a, a wealth of work experience working in hospital administration with IOM USAID and and most recently obviously as a pal pal woman parliamentarian in in the Ugandan parliament um, and most uh, relevant perhaps to this this call has been a strong advocate for the prevention of violence against children in in Uganda over to you uh, honorable minister thank you very much Amanda uh, I want to thank all the, the, uh, the people who have been telling, showing us their, their presentation. Um, again, my name is Esther Anyakun. I'm from, from Uganda. And I, I congratulate you all for having the passion for children. I am delighted to having uh, joined this convening focus on the area that I'm more passionate about, especially on children, about this. Uh, child rights and areas where I currently provide policy directions 
uh, in the Ministry of Disaster Preparedness and Refugees. The government of Uganda is very keen on the rights of refugees and displaced persons and has policies and laws in place to guarantee their rights. The protection of children from all forms of violation, violence is sent central to the government of Uganda. This commitment is demonstrated by the policy legal and administrative framework that have been put in place from the protection of child rights. This there shows the commitment to protection of children in all settings. Allow me share some of these key measures uh, to uh, show this. In 2016, Uganda joined uh, the group of pathfinding countries to model efforts of prevent, to prevent and respond to uh, violence against uh, children. This has been a major drive to action to prevent and respond to violence against children. Some of the achievements uh, re realized in the area of violence uh, prevention include enact, enactment, uh, enactment the act, Children's Act 2016, Children's, uh, children's uh, Ugandan Children's Act has detailed provision on VAC and also specific, specifically as the National Child Helpline embedded in, in the law. Enactment of the prohibition, prohibition of Human Sacrifice Act 2021. This is when I was in this uh, 10th parliament. Uh, this being the most recent law passed by the Parliament of Uganda and ascended to by His Excellency, the President Yoweri Kaguta Museveni, that looks at the protection and curbing the gaps that exist uh, in, in this country. Uh, strengthen partnership and collaboration, facilitated multiple stakeholder synergy, i.e. the intra and multi-sectoral task forces in uh, VAC. In 2020, enacted the national child policy. Among the key objectives in the policy is one focusing on providing uh, coordinated national frameworks to prevent, respond to, the, to and protect ch children from all forms of violence, exploitation, abuse, and neglect. The policy also uh, explicit provides for children in disaster and emergency situations. Uh, strategy number six, uh, this was developed and implemented as a national response for prevention of, of and resettling of all children in crisis, disaster, and emergency, including street situations. Why has Uganda made strides in this? High level political, uh, political will, supported by robust policy and legal framework, and commitment to, the implement, to its implementation. Uh, national child policy was anonymously approved by cabinet chaired by His Excellency, the President of the uh, Hello, colleagues, do you hear me? Sabine? I think um, she froze. Ah, sorry, Honourable oh. Minister, we froze, you froze in a very nice position for a moment. Um, so maybe, but now we can see your lovely <laughs> smile back. So please continue. Ah. Okay, so um, the National Child Policy has also far been uh, disseminated and coordinated in committees, especially in 31 out of the 146 districts in Uganda. Strong national level partnership and collaboration as already indicated, Uganda has benefited from support of wide range partnership, partners in, uh, in effort to present and also respond to uh, violence against children. In 2020, with support from global partnership to end violence against children. And Avis, the government adapted, adapted and implemented the good school tool kit in the, in the refugee setting. Uh, the, the, the good school tool is an evidence-based intervention to make schools safe for the children. Through this, the program uh, reached 133 teached one, and also 7,190 children. That is 60% of the children uh, uh, in the refugee setting. We, inv we invited partners to invest in this and also enable us scale up uh, to include all the 
refugee settlement in, in their country. Protecting children from violence in humanitarian setting requires strong partnership and collaboration and investment in prevention and response to violence, exploitation and abuse of children in all humanitarian response plans. As government, as a government, we are committed to undertake our role, count on the continued support and collaboration of partners. Once again, uh, I thank you for making me part of this important meeting. And as government, we have also very special ideas that we are, we are wishing to share with you uh, on ending violence of humanitarian settings. Uganda maintained its open door policy during the, to the refugees, especially from DRC and South Sudan when the conflicts broke out this year. Yet even we had restrictions of uh, COVID-19 at, at all our border posts among our SOPs. We have also experienced a very low funding from partners due to the effect of the COVID-19 pandemic, particularly this for the past 18 months. For example, WFP uh, reduced the food ration, for example, by 30% at the refugee settlements. Uh, there are related challenges that come in such, and also schools have been closed, including refugee schools. So uh, I, I don't know how, how can partners come in to, meet, to mitigate this kind of emergency than my country. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Honourable Minister. I mean, it's such inspiring uh, to see the leadership that the Ugandan government has played um, in terms of actually the political commitment, but also the policies and the programs and spanning everything from that high level political commitment right down to concrete programs that actually deliver protection in the schools to 60% to of refugees. I mean, it's an incredible achievement that you've done together with the partners there in Uganda. So thank you very much for that. And another show again, as many of, of the colleagues have said before, that it is possible with political will with um, you know expertise and 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 working together that we can really protect children from violence. So thank you so much for for your commitment and your intervention today. I also just wanted to highlight maybe one thing that you did say that obviously as UNHCR you know would like to to pick up is is the importance of of ensuring that that um, children and their families can flee from armed conflict and seek safety. So we also want to thank the government of Uganda, as well as all other governments and partners who, who continue to provide that opportunity to protect children by ensuring that they can flee um, to safety across borders or within their countries um, from, from areas that are currently experiencing um, armed conflict. So thank you very much again. Um, we're going to now turn to, um, I believe the, the last, but certainly not the least uh, speaker on our panel today, um, Dr. Mohammed Horani, who is the Director of Programs and Training at the Jordan River Foundation, an organization which I had the pleasure to work very closely with when I was in Jordan. And, and I'm very familiar with the, the excellent work that the Jordan River Foundation has been uh, doing in both preventing and responding to violence against children for many years. Um, uh, uh, Mr. Harani Muhammad has had, uh, you know, extensive uh, experience on child safety and community empowerment programs over 20 years of experience in development um, and, and programs supporting women and children, and uh, also has a PhD in education and psychology. So I think we probably have one of the most educated panels around. Um, over to you, Muhammad. Thank you so much. Uh, and uh, honestly, thank you so much for hosting uh, me. And it is my honor and privilege to represent my organization in this very important uh, summit. Allow me to share a very quick presentation and to briefly go through the context in Jordan. Jordan was one of the first countries that uh, signed the Convention on the Right of uh, the Children, under which children have the right to survival, education and development, health and nutrition, protection and uh, participation. Uh, two, uh, 20 years ago, Jordan has taken a massive steps to uh, 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 prepare and enable the environment to prevent uh, children abuse and uh, 
uh, it started with uh, uh, whether uh, issuing or amending or drafting laws and policies and procedures uh, like uh, the uh, protection against domestic violence uh, laws, which was issued in 2017. Uh, also, the penal code uh, laws, uh, labor laws, and the right of person with disabilities and the uh, juvenile uh, justice uh, system in general. And to make sure that uh, those uh, rights are upheld comprehensively, a lot of organization on national level has been established like the Family Protection Department under the Police uh, Division, the National uh, Council for Family Affairs, and the National Center for Human uh, uh, Rights uh, uh, in general, and uh, a lot of coordination uh, that uh, made sure that the, the synergy in the implementation is put in place. Uh, a lot of co coordinations and frameworks has been put in place in, co in coordination with the entities working in the protection sector. So national frameworks has been put, national standard operating procedures, and a lot of coordination platforms has been established. Last year, the Family Protection Department has reported around 55,000 abuse uh, cases, and this is an increase compared to the previous year. It's almost 22% increase compared to the previous year, and uh, the pandemic COVID-19 has played a significant role in this increase because the uh, perpetrator and the uh, victim has been uh, locked uh, under the same uh, roof uh, in, in which uh, the physical abuse was mainly the, the, the largest portion of the abuse cases in 2020. The sexual abuse was almost one third of the abused uh, cases. Uh, uh, children uh, was mostly more than a quarter of the abused cases uh, last year. Uh, in which Jordanian has the largest percentage, but Syrians has also around 6% of the abused uh, cases. Uh, allow me just to introduce my organization. Jordan River Foundation is one of the oldest national organizations in the country, which was established in 1995 with the mandate of protect, protecting uh, children and uh, supporting the economic uh, situation in our communities in support to the national efforts on achieving the sustainable development goals. GRF mainly uh, 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 achieve its vision and mission through two, two main programs, the Community Empowerment One and the Child Safety Program, which will be the focus of my presentation today. But the Community Empowerment Program in a very nutshell, focuses on building sustainable livelihood and create economic opportunities in the uh, community. Going back to the child safety program, the children well-being is the main focus in which we do have two main pillars to support the achievement of uh, this uh, uh, ambition and vision in which we GRF has uh, uh, intervention services to support the victim of abuse like case management services, psychosocial services, and one of the uh, 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 largest helpline in the country, which is the second after 911 when it comes to family and child uh, uh, protection. It's a free helpline called 110. In addition to the prevention activities that uh, focuses on building the, uh, the, the, the education and awareness of community members in the preservation, and the rights of uh, children and uh, women. The uh, focus of our prevention services is the emotional empowerment uh, of our community. It focuses on building knowledge, education, and experience on how to prevent uh, community members and specifically children and women from the cases of abuse or from being victim of abuse using artistic and expressive art methodologies. So we don't just jump and try to force the concepts of child protection on our beneficiaries. The uh, activities we adopt to achieve uh, or to uh, convey our uh, messages uh, uh, varies. Uh, uh, we sometimes uh, target women, sometimes toddlers, and most of the time children, and also adolescents and youth with uh, educational and expressive art 
uh, activities in, uh, from which we, some, we on annual basis reach around 15,000 beneficiaries. The intervention services are meant to support the victim of abuse. And we do have, uh, as I said, the national helpline that provides uh, free service in which anybody in the king kingdom in the country can call to seek consultation, refer or report a case of abuse or uh, uh, seek referral services to other uh, partners li like medical, uh, education, or even uh, law firms. Uh, our case management services has been established in, nine, uh, in 2009, and it, it's the advocate of the cases of, of abuse until uh, we uh, arrive with them to the safe haven and we uh, help them to remove any risk factors. And the uh, uh, third service is the psychosocial one, which was launched in 2000. Uh, and it's meant to help the survivor of abuse to uh, relieve and to remove any uh, uh, psychosocial uh, impact of the case on, on their personality and their communication and contribution to the uh, community. In average, on an annual basis, we serve more than 3,500 3, victims of abuse. Uh, we, uh, in the case management services, uh, psychosocial services are provided to more than 300 beneficiaries, and we receive uh, a, a mass number of calls, but the callers who receive the actual service is around 7,000 callers on a on yearly uh, basis. I'm trying to be very fast, uh, so I allow uh, the time for discussions and uh, uh, questions. We do have a, 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 a learning uh, uh, monitoring and evaluation and accountability and learning department, which uh, usually focus on, on monitoring the, the, the output and outcomes of our activities in which they reported that, that last year, 80% of our targeted uh, mothers reported improvement in parental care and improvement in their uh, children's uh, knowledge uh, and ability to protect the, themselves. Uh, more than uh, 94 of our beneficiaries uh, uh, stated that the psychosocial services and the, the counseling improved their emotional well-being in terms of decreased uh, the level of stress, uh, anxiety, nightmares, and uh, all uh, uh, related uh, uh, symptoms of uh, the abused cases. 60% of the monitored parents reported a change in their uh, uh, rearing practices and parenting uh, practices. Uh, during COVID, uh, the restrictions and limitations on movement uh, 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 challenged us and we uh, adapted uh, our approaches and invested in the helpline which helped us uh, to uh, remotely provide uh, our services uh, regardless of uh, time and uh, uh, location, especially with the limitations uh, in movement. And we responded to the emerging need uh, of our community and specifically uh, focused on uh, the COVID impact on the children's well-being. And uh, uh, packages has been developed and implemented remotely with families. Uh, to tackle these issues and uh, also uh, uh, a lot of movement towards uh, preventing online sexual exploitations has been uh, put in place in which uh, online learning and other platforms has been uh, also observed in our community and there has been a demand and a need on uh, safeguarding our uh, children from online uh, uh, risks. In general, we, uh, as part of the globe, we face uh, challenges, and uh, most of the challenges are common on, on the global level, like uh, what I heard from uh, my colleague Hani, the, the, the support and the financial support, the donation to the uh, intervention uh, services is not always stable. It's, uh, it comes with uh, short cycles, but it also focuses only on the intervention after the abuse case happened. Limited uh, support and uh, investment goes to preventing uh, the cause and uh, the preventing the case of, of abuses and uh, spreading the knowledge, the awareness, uh, and uh, uh, protecting our community before 
the, the case uh, happen. Also in, in community level, there's lack of involvement uh, due to uh, cultural uh, norms and uh, maybe with the social cohesion being one of the uh, challenges uh, we face, maybe uh, more uh, community-based interventions in, in terms of holistic uh, interventions can, is, is much needed in our communities. Uh, in terms of capacity and because a lot of investment has been allocated to supporting the cases of abuse, so limited investment has been made to build the capacity of the frontliners and the, the actors who, uh, who, uh, who serves uh, in, in, uh, in uh, the sector, so the, their capacity is uh, traditional and sometimes uh, limited. Uh, investment in 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 their in, in their self care or in the, their uh, innovative ways of uh, supporting uh, the, the the sector and achieve, achieving their community and the intersectorial uh, challenge is as well one of the common challenges in which a lot of interventions has been uh, uh, done in silos with limited coordinations and bits and pieces of interventions, whether uh, uh, in coordination between prevention and uh, intervention services, or even responding to the economic needs of the families that can as well uh, uh, lighten the impact of uh, uh, and uh, minimizing the risks on our uh, families. Thank you so much. I try to be uh, quick in time. Uh, Thank you very much, Mohammed. Yeah, no, thank you. I mean, I think what's what's uh, fascinating about, I mean, there's many fascinating things about your 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 the work that uh, GRF is doing. But I think one thing that certainly struck me was your ability to combine prevention and response, and having a holistic package, so that we're not, uh, you know, investing in as one of the other speakers said. You're not talking about taking away from that response because that response needs to be there, but also, you know, finding a way to to scale up and and invest the you know a, a significant amount of our resources in those kind of practical prevention programs and also the fact that you had those different layers of um, uh, types of intervention according to the age, the gender. I mean, that was really fascinating and also obviously the the way you've adapted your programming. Um, to to COVID um, and addressing the online risk. So thank you so much for that. Um, we're going to now uh, take some questions um, that we've received so far. So please feel free to pop additional questions in, in, in the chat. Um, the first question will be to Chi Chi, and apologies, I'm looking at my screen where the questions are uh, over here. But Chi Chi, uh, will the survey, will the survey um, da collect data among both uh, host and displaced persons? Um, and how would you say that the idea of carrying out the VAC survey in refugee settings has been received by the government and other key partners? Thank you. Um, as much as we would have liked to, and, and I know that um, given our previous work in Uganda, you know, we typically do get that question about whether we are involving the host community. And the host communities, although they will be involved in, in shaping the study, um, in terms of actual, you know, being actual participants, we really do want to focus it um, squarely on refugees. Um, that said, the research program consortium um, that is um, uh, implementing this survey with uh, technical assistance from the CDC and Together for Girls uh, will involve um, other surveys and studies. Um, uh, in which host community uh, populations will be involved, just not for this particular VAC survey. Um, and the other question was about how, um, how this uh, has been received. Uh, fortunately, um, we are not new to um, the refugee uh, context uh, in Uganda, uh, particularly, and already came in with strong relationships with uh, the Office of the Prime Minister, uh, Department of Refugees. And um, fortunately, we found um, a very warm welcome um, uh, where the study is concerned, and there's the sense that there really is, you know, a need uh, for this, um, not just by the government, but by UNHCR, the country operation, and so on and so forth. So we're looking forward to it. Thank you. 
Thank you so much. I mean, it sounds like we're all impatiently waiting the results of, of the survey. Um, maybe staying on the theme of the survey, I'll, I'll now turn to Daniela or uh, Begonia. I'm not sure if Daniela is still online or if, if Begonia, you're there. Hi, Amanda. Yes, it's Begonia. Daniela, okay. too. Yeah. Great. So maybe you can introduce yourself quickly before you answer the question. But um, we have two questions for you. Uh, what challenges do you anticipate uh, facing in the implementation of back surveys in humanitarian settings? And can you talk a little bit about the difference in uh, VAC survey information that you would um, you would make uh, versus programming uh, for VAC without robust data? Those are great questions. Um, so I think to start, um, I would say that the, the VAX, as, as we concluded after a series of consultations um, last year, the VAX wouldn't necessarily be appropriate um, for just any humanitarian setting. There, there are specific settings that we think would lend themselves to um, to uh, violence against children and youth survey. So that's, I guess, the first challenge is that finding the, the right place to, to pilot. And we're excited to be working with Chi Chi um, to, to do that first piloting and testing of, of, of the survey, of the questionnaire, of the methodology. So, um, and, and seeing what lessons learned uh, we, we have after that experience and, and, and where else the, the survey can be piloted. But really, the survey um, as, as it is now um, would work best in a kind of protected, established um, refugee camp um, type of setting as opposed to a more kind of acute, acute uh, crisis um, setting. So I think the challenge is, is kind of finding the, going by kind of a set of criteria to, to really find the right place to, to, do the, um, to do the survey. The next I think is, is what, Chi Chi alluded to is it's the having the right set of partners. Um, and I'm really glad that Chi Chi covered that because it is really about um, who you're working with, having the right representation from um, governments, UN partners, civil society, and, and really making sure that there is local buy-in for the survey. Um, then there are several, I think, implementation challenges that would depend on the context. So I won't go into details there, but really what to do in, in places where you can't ensure privacy for participants in, um, and, and how do you make those adjustments in order to, to first and foremost, protect um, the survey participants. Um, and then to, to the second point, um, I think the having robust data like the VAC survey provides um, gives you information, as we've mentioned, about the context of violence. So it's not just about knowing the how the magnitude and the levels of violence, but really where is the violence occurring? Um, who's perpetrating it? Um, and what are the consequences? What are the challenges to accessing services? Um, and I think because there is so much data that comes out of a VAC survey, and there is data for really for every sector, there's data for the health sector, education, justice, child protection, even the, the, the process of, of implementing the survey brings all those sectors together as a starting place. So it's already the sectors are coordinating on, on the survey implementation, giving their input. Um, and, and that's a really good starting point to then start thinking about what are some of those um, multi-sectoral interventions that, that, that we know can reduce violence. Um, so I think that, that knowing that and having that sort of data is really important. And then there's the data for advocacy, and these two are complementary. The more we know about how much violence is happening, uh, the more we can um, raise awareness and increase funding um, for, for preventing violence, which we've you know, heard again and again um, today that, that there is a serious funding gap. Great, thank you so much, uh, Begonia. Um, I, did you introduce yourself or did I miss it? Miss it? I got so excited about answering the questions that I did not introduce myself. Okay, <laughs> I can Perhaps do that now. Do that. Yes, hi, I am Begonia Fernandez. I'm a senior technical officer at um, Together for Girls. Great, thanks, Begonia. Um, and Begonia has kindly agreed to replace Daniela, who had another commitment, so had to step out. 
Um, I'll now turn to Melissa and, uh, and Elizabeth. Um, we have two questions for you. The first one is, what do you consider to be essential protection services for children? And does this include prevention programs such as parent support programs? Um, and the second question, it's, it's, um, is, is a, a comment, but uh, it's excellent to see um, the US government uh, prioritizing prevention in humanitarian action. How do you think we can help uh, donors and governments advance the pre prevention agenda? Thank you so much. I'll jump in. Um, and uh, Melissa may or may not um, jump in after it gets up to her. Um, as to essential protection services, I think we would go with what we know is has been promoted across um, the child protection space, the child protection space, um, what we see in the CPMS, um, a lot of what we see actually on the development side, the entire strategy we speak to. Um, when we look at humanitarian settings, we're looking at services which are addressing violence, exploitation, and abuse. So everything from case management tracing child-friendly spaces and other structured activities, adolescent centers, these sorts of things that give children a, a safe space um, and a place to access services holistically and robustly. Um, and such great questions, by the way, I'm, I'm enjoying all of these um, to the panelists. But I would say in terms of as we look at um, how can we, and the way the question is phrased, it sounds like what you're asking is how can we providers um, really push donors and governments to prioritize prevention? Um, a few things I would say, um, first in terms of demand, demonstrating the demand, and that requires data. And this is partly why BHA is taking a uh, focus on data at the moment. Um, and we do know protection specifically doesn't always get the data required. It, it, exploitation happens in, in spaces and is stigmatized and is not easily quantifiable. Um, but where we can present even a qualitative picture of what is happening, we must, we must get protection into the HNOs, the HRPs. Um, that is one. Second, in terms of the messaging, we must recognize the audience and speak the language that they that will move them and uh, for governments and for for most settings numbers speak um, financially speaking prevention done right should be much cheaper and should have much greater impact and reduce spend long term rather than response and if we can get that message across it should be a part of how we advocate for prevention also, we must prove ourselves capable and ready to take the funding that is provided then and run with it and do appropriate services. And in order to do that, uh, we must demonstrate that we have the tools. And I will say through the Alliance, and there's such a fantastic collection space for all the tools and guidance that is at our fingertips um, for prevention. Um, second, we must have the human resources and we must be capacitated. And again, we have a global community that is capacitated, but again, as I said earlier, so grateful to see the Alliance really honing in on localization and what does that mean? And let's raise up um, a workforce right at the ground level and um, that will support the systems um, that we're asking governments to put in place in order to uh, conduct prevention activities. Um, we also must uh, have two last points. We must have a united vision because um, uh, where we're reunited, we stand better together. And again, this Alliance meeting all focused around prevention is really uh, bringing together, I think a very uh, united front for this. And so I think we just stand in a better place going forward. Um, and then last, I always think of the 20, 80% rule. It takes 20% of any population to influence the 80%. Um, work those relationships. It only takes a few to change the minds of many. Um, so get in where you know that you can find an advocate. It's why we have these things. We're looking for advocates. Um, and get them to speak on your behalf as well. 
Great, thank you. Uh, I'm going to build on, on one important point as we are running out of time and I would like to, we have so many questions uh, that we have and, and such a rich discussion, but I would like to give at least an opportunity to, to, the, to the Honourable Minister. Building on one of the things that, that was mentioned here, I mean, how do you, as you've talked about the, the child protection policy that was, that was um, launched, but in your setting, how do you ensure that, you know, in settings like the, the refugee settings, we have enough um, human resources to really, and, and qualified staff to be able to turn that policy into practice? Over to you, uh, the Honourable Minister. Okay, it seems that uh, uh, Sabine, can you still see her online or has she had to step off? Looks like she had to step off. Okay. Okay, so maybe we'll then move to Mohammed for the last question before I hand over to Howard um, to wrap up. Um, so, uh, Mohammed, you talked about your investment in, in prevention services and um, I just and, and your engagement with community. Can you say a bit about have you been able to measure prevention? Because we saw those very disturbing statistics um, that you mentioned it from the Family Protection Department about an increase in violence during COVID um, of 22%. Of so how do you go about in your organization measuring uh, the impact of the prevention activities? And that is, is that an area where you're, you know, what have you been able to do? Are there still challenges in that area? Yeah, it is one of the challenging, uh, as uh, as you might know, a challenging uh, measure to to take place. Uh, uh, nevertheless, we uh, uh, usually collaborate with uh, schools, and uh, we do uh, a lot of activities in collaboration with the uh, safe spaces uh, uh, centers in the community centers, and we reach out to families and to children, in addition to the adolescents who comes to our. Uh, locations and two community centers. We usually build uh, pre and post uh, assessment tools, but we don't count only on them because we uh, 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 as well refer back to uh, parents and teachers to, to seek feedback on their observations of uh, their children after attending the uh, preventive uh, activities or the educational activities that teach students are or children has been put in. So parents, uh, educators, uh, caregivers and teachers usually give us uh, heads up and feedback on to which extent uh, their uh, the behavior of their children has been changed, to which extent they are taking a very cautious measure when they're dealing with their neighboring uh, environment, when it comes to uh, playing around the school or the house, whether in the grocery shops, in the garden or in the street, and in, in addition, to uh, their knowledge of their trust, uh, trust cycles and uh, how they uh, inform and report uh, uh, the, the uh, uh, cases that they uh, have been put in. So uh, some of parents uh, feels like those, uh, sometimes the, the, the concepts of protections are taboos, they don't communicate with their kids about, but we have been receiving feedback that, that uh, 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 the community centers and the, the, the uh, colleagues who are conducting the preventive activities has managed to break this cycle and uh, has also contributed to the community awareness. Thank you so much, Mohammed. So unfortunately, our time is running out and I see um, Howard online. So um, Howard is, I, I forget your exact title, Howard. So I'll ask you to, to confirm your exact title, but I know that you are, you know, the executive director or the lead, somehow the lead of, of the partnership to end violence. Um, and so over to you, Howard, for some including remarks and also to correct uh, my obviously inability to uh, remember your official title. Over to you. Thanks, Amanda. I think you've done a fabulous job. Um, I'm Howard Taylor. I'm the executive director of the Global Partnership to End Violence Against Children. So a very big thank you to you, Amanda, for, for moderating, but also to everyone involved in the organizations and individuals in preparing for today's event, for our expert speakers, Honorable Minister, and all the participants. And I just really hope that you all, like me, feel 
both informed by what we've heard today, but also inspired by what we've heard, inspired to step up our evidence-based advocacy and action to prevent all violence against children in humanitarian settings. As we've heard, we are living at a time when children around the world are facing an unprecedented combination of simultaneous crises. And the underlying drivers include conflict, climate change, and of course, the COVID-19 pandemic. 70% of children living in crisis-affected countries, a staggering 235 million people worldwide in need of humanitarian assistance and protection. And that's up uh, it's one in 33 people, which is up from one in 45 a year ago. So the trend is very clearly in the wrong direction. The situation is grave. And if the situation is grave, why am I inspired by what I've heard today as well as informed? And I've been scribbling notes as we've gone, and I'm going to try and capture a few takeaways. But I'm inspired because I believe that what we've heard today and the evidence-based proposals, the examples of progress which have been shared, uh, have the ingredients among them for doing better and ending violence against children in humanitarian settings. So I'm going to speak very briefly just the five key takeaways that I have from listening to today's conversation among the experts and practitioners. And those five takeaways are around data, integration, inclusivity, prevention and investment. First, data and evidence matters. We need that to fully understand the magnitude and the nature of violence against children in humanitarian settings and to inform prevention and response, to monitor and track our progress and to inform the case we need to make, the better, stronger, more compelling case we need to make for action and investment to end violence against children in humanitarian second settings. Secondly, we must promote an integrated approach, and that means integrated across sectors, but also across stakeholders, bridging the gap between development and humanitarian actors and action, sharing the evidence-based best practice, such as the Inspire strategies and others, which will inform multi-sectoral approaches for a holistic response and prevention. Third, inclusivity. These newly collaborative approaches must be community driven, they must be child centered, gender responsive and inclusive of the most vulnerable children, including those forced from their homes. And irrespective of a child's legal status, whether that is a refugee, a migrant, a citizen or, or other, we have to be fully inclusive. Fourth, we need to advocate for and invest in prevention of violence against children in humanitarian settings, as well as improving our response. We must always remember that behind the big data, the big numbers are individual children who experience violence and sexual abuse in humanitarian settings. And we owe it to each and every one of those children to do better on prevention. Response needs to be better, but we must dial up the action on prevention, which I think informs the fifth, my fifth and final takeaway informed by all of the above is really developing a more compelling case for investment, investment to prevent and respond to violence against children in humanitarian settings. And we heard, I think, a compelling case for more multi-year funding, not shorter term funding cycles and funding that is proportionate to the scale and the impact of violence. And I think it was Melissa just now spoke about how prevention is, of course, much more cost effective and therefore more compelling, maybe more attractive to donors, governments and investors that we need to crowd in more into this space. And all of this means coming together as we are today to raise awareness of the needs of children in the context of migration and humanitarian settings and make that compelling case. And this event, as has been mentioned, is a part of the Together to End Violence campaign and Solution Summit series. And that series really is intended as a platform to do just what we're doing today, enable us to speak, to listen, to learn, and then to advocate together with one voice. And earlier this year, under the auspices of Together to End Violence, we brought experts together to develop a set of policy pro proposals to end violence against children in all settings. And six policy proposals emerged from a much longer initial list including a call to protect children from violence in humanitarian settings and to incorporate and adequately fund prevention and response to violence, exploitation and abuse of children in all humanitarian response plans. And so the M Violence Partnership and our many partners, we have 650 partner organizations and governments will continue to promote and support this important agenda. And Amanda, if I may, I want to finish by building on something that one of our speakers said earlier today. I'm gonna to take what they said, but I'm gonna build it. 
uh, and end by saying prevention is possible and violence against children in humanitarian settings is not intractable. Thank you. Thank you so much, Howard, and thank you to everybody. We've run a few minutes over, but that was like a clockwork uh, a presentation with so many great speakers. Um, we very much thank everybody who's participated and wish you a good morning, evening, afternoon, um, and hope to see you in the next event. Bye for now. Thank you, bye. Everyone, bye. Thank you, bye-bye. Thank you.